Lloyd, it's great to be back in the studio again for another episode of Positively Geared. How have you been? It's welcome you back. I've been really well, Armando. It's great to be here. Uh, the sun's out today. We've had a couple of weeks of continuous rain and really excited to be in here today. And I think we've got a great episode in store. Yeah, I think we have. We've got a really special guest on today. We've got a gentleman that's been on the cover of Men's Health. He's been on TV. He's been on Have You Paying Attention. He's been on Thank God You're Here. He's a radio personality. I'd like to welcome to our podcast, Ed Cavalier. Thank you for having me, gentlemen. It is great to be in a place with two property experts because uh, safe to say I have tried my hand over the journey and it's always been just like thank God you're here. I've walked through a door I knew nothing about and the results have been often quite terrible. Looking forward to learning something today. Oh, great to hear. So obviously we're a property show. We'd, we'd like to start to know a little bit about your property journey and maybe where it all started. Okay, so mid twenties, I uh, I actually we had a so it's actually a little bit of background. I grew up with my mother, single mother, who did an incredible job with me and my sister raising us, uh, and we almost always we always almost rented, and you know, mum did a great job, you know, providing us with a roof over our heads, etc. That sort of, as you know, what that does often for kids is it puts, which is great for me, which is somewhat of a work ethic. So I was always someone who had jobs very early in life. So um, growing up in Sydney, I would take. A, a bucket and uh, some sponges and I would go to, when I was about 11, I would go to the car park at Chatswood to see if people wanted their car washed uh, while they were off doing their shopping. And then we moved uh, sort of in and around sort of the eastern suburbs. And as you know, in the eastern suburbs, the property is anything between a room in a bed sit in Surrey Hills for, you know, $50 a week back then, this is in the 90s, to a $300 million house in Darling Point. So there's every range you could ever hope for. And when I was in my sort of mid, uh, mid-20s, mid um, through a large confluence of court cases, which I won't go into, we had ended up with a little bit of money for the first time, my mother and I. And because I thought I was smart, which I'm not, I said, don't worry, mum, I'll take care of us. And I bought off the plan an apartment in Melbourne. Now, I should say, I'd never been to Melbourne at this point, but this was in the early 2000s when people kept telling you, you just sign this piece of paper for an apartment off the plan somewhere in the world, and in six months, we'll send you a check for a million dollars. That didn't happen. I remember the first letter I got from that apartment block was, I'm sorry to inform you, but the, and look, Lloyd, you'll know this better than I do, but something about the, not cladding, but like the the shutters, they, they'd missed they'd miscalculated uh, the shutters and they wanted $12,000 to fix the shutters on a building that hadn't yet been built. And safe to say, I couldn't keep up with the costs and I just hadn't read the contract. So we lost it. I sold it at a loss in my mid-20s, all my money gone that my mother had fought so hard for in this court case. And I had so much guilt attached to that, that I had wasted this money that she had fought tooth and nail for for our family. And I was very, I'm not scarred, but I was very scared after that to sort of go back in uh, because I just didn't have any knowledge. You know what it's like. Well, you just, there was in the time in the early 2000s where, you know, apartments off the plan, if you went to the train station, someone would sell you one. And we all thought we were going to be the So, from them. Ed, did you actually uh, finish that apartment or did you actually sell it before it was finished? Can I, can I tell you something, guys? I actually, um, <laughs> every time I go to the city in Melbourne, I go past that apartment block and I see it and I see that apartment block and I know the floor it's on and I never actually went there and I get triggered. Every, not triggered. What am I talking about? I walk past it and every time I walk past it, I shudder because I'm like up there somewhere is someone who got the cheapest apartment in the world because I was so stupid. So I didn't even make it to completion. Yeah, that's, uh, it's, it's pretty amazing that because you're right. Back in those days, people were just trying to sell anything. And a massive problem that uh, particularly Melbourne has, that the council were releasing way too many developments, uh, badly built, badly designed, and uh, and promising big things. You know, buy an apartment off the plan. It'll be finished in a few years' time, and it'll go up in lots of value. And, of course, when there's so many of them that came onto the market at the same time, it actually went down in value, and the value of those have never recovered. So it's probably worth the same or less than what you bought it for 20-odd years ago. Yeah, look, Lloyd, it's so nice to hear you say that 20 years later. I, mean, I don't know where you were 20 years ago when I needed you, but that is a perfect summation of my horrific financial mistake. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, so what came after that? 
fear, a lot of fear and just going, I was, you know, terrified of debt. You know, I was someone who never wanted to have any debt in my life because, you know, we sort of lived that way with, with when I was growing up and I'd started working, as you know, I was lucky enough to start working in my industry and I was terrified of debt. And there was another opportunity that came up where someone that I knew through media said, oh, look, I actually know of an apartment that's come up um, and sadly the uh, owner has passed away. The family don't want to do anything, but they're hoping just to sell it quickly off market and it was in a very nice location. And if you did it here, you could either live in it or you could renovate it and sell it. And I, at this stage, was terrified of debt. I was so scared to have any debt at all. I paid off my hex just by working crazy. And thank you for asking. Yes, I did get an arts degree uh, from Sydney University. It's a three-year degree, and I got it in just under six years, so just under the wire there. And I can tell you that when you finish a six-year arts degree majoring in art history from Sydney University, gentlemen, the job offers do not come flooding in. So I was, I was I was an usher for Puppetry of the Penis at the Footbridge Theatre. I was driving <laughs> the promotional vehicles for Today FM, a station I still work for, and I had property dreams. But I got a job, my first job on Thank God You're Here. So I had real sort of income for the first time. And this, this opportunity came up and I was terrified of debt. But my accountant, who I still have now, actually talked me into saying, no, look, this is not this is an established apartment with a lift. You know that, Lloyd? Oh, it's got a lift. Oh, my God, it's got a lift. You know that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at that. Look how happy you two are. Oh, a lift. <laughs> yeah. It's got a lift. Right. And also, here's the big one. Did it have a pool as well? Or a no, it's just a lift. So there's no money sucks. But here's the one. The lift had already been serviced. And I remember when the real estate agent told me, it was like he was telling me like a pornographic story. He goes, and the thing about the lift is it's already been serviced. And I was like, I'd have never seen a man more excited than him at that prospect that you didn't have to pay to service the lift, right? Which sounds like a euphemism by itself. So I did it. I got, I was like, all right, I got all the money I had together. I was so terrified and that went okay. That was in a really good location. I held it for a little while. We sort of fixed it up because this gentleman who'd been living there hadn't really done much. And then we made a small profit from that, that, and I'm not trying to say I'm a hero or anything, but most of that I sort of funneled back to my mum to say, Sorry that I ruined our life the first time. This sort of got us back somewhat even to where we were. Yeah, it was good to see you got a positive story at there at the end as yeah, well. Yeah, otherwise so. this was turning into the Imperfects podcast where everyone's just having a big old winch. No, this is the... And <laughs> was that one in... Was that in Melbourne Yeah, well? so this, was, but in this was in, um, in South Yarra, which as you guys know, is like a Paddington sort of vibe in Sydney or, or like... Um, I don't have a Perth equivalent. You will because you you know the town. But that's the sort of that's the sort of energy of it. In a city, closer to the city, older sort of folk, but it's a well established suburb. All right. So, and also know you purchased a home with your your wife as well a couple of years ago, and you sold that last year, and that sounded like that was a positive experience All as right. well. So here's the other thing I'm terrible at: auctions. I, was, I loved your book, Lloyd. I loved the podcast that you guys do. I learned so much from it. And, you know, I was fascinated on the chapter about auctions and how to buy. And I, as I was listening, I was driving and I was laughing to myself. And I was like, once again, I've done everything wrong. Here's what my wife and I did at the auction for our for our first home that we were so excited. We both worked hard. Look, whatever. I don't need to give you sob stories about how hard we all worked. Everyone's working hard out there. We all know that, right? Point was, we got to the point where we had finance. We had a deposit. We could go buy a house. We went to an auction. And okay, so are you two, are you two, but I know you're married. Are you both married? Not to each other, but in general. Not yet. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. I've got a partner what do you as mean, well. Not yet. Got you sort of years. went not yet. Ah, uh, yes, I've got a partner. <laughs> what do we, do we need to? I'm, I'm divorced and yeah, I've got a new partner now. I've got three children. Divorced? It's my dream. How did you, how did you go property wise in the divorce? I did okay in the divorce through property wise. Yes, I did all right. All right. Um, I, get we I get it. I get it. Secret bank account. I get it. Secret bank account. No, accounts. we worked out. We worked out an amicable that's arrangement, right. and it, it worked out. Okay. You know what? That's actually yeah, a very, very positive story because, as we both know, that's a whole nother podcast. Well, that is a great thing. <laughs> <laughs> the positively split up podcast. So, um, the, the positively divided assets. There's a podcast we could enjoy. So. Um, uh, anyway, so my wife and I, my current wife, I like to call her, we rock up to this auction and it passed, it got passed in, it got passed in, right? So the agent comes out, who's someone we knew from the area and he says, look, do you want to make an offer? You know, they want, they want this amount and right. My wife was the only person who'd bid. So we were the, obviously the underbid or whatever. You we're the only people who'd bid. Here's how the negotiations went. So, all right, you guys can play the, the role of the agent. Lloyd, you play the role of the agent. Just say, 
for, for argument's sake, they want $1 million, right? And I'll play the part of my wife uh, in this negotiation. Take it away. Okay, so um, you're the underbidder. Obviously, didn't quite make mm-hmm. the reserve. Right. Uh, you guys do have the first choice to mm-hmm. put in an offer mm-hmm. and see how we go. What would you yep. like to do? Yep. No, you can now say the price. Now say how much they want. They want one million. They want one million dollars. Well, the minimum is is one million dollars. That'll get it over the line. Okay, great. We'll pay it today. Yep. Thanks. Okay. Was, was that was our negotiation. Done that was it. That was that was it. <laughs> and I'm looking at her, and she's pumped, and I'm like, "What are you doing?" And she's like, "Well, that's how much they want." I'm like, "No." <laughs> But you bought a house, can't we? Too? Yeah, you got a house together, but right? It was great because we got the house and we loved the house and our first you know, child was there and it was all great. However, one, one, so now we've now sold that house, but we did a lot of work on that house, guys. What's it called when you do work on a house that people don't see? What's that? It's got a name. What's that called? I think it's called hit, cosmetic hidden. Cosmetic work? The opposite hidden of that. Cosmetic like work. Stuff that, yes, like we fixed a bunch of stuff that was like pipes and all this stuff. How annoying is that? Because you can't see it and you can't sell on it. But you know what a, I mean? It's essential work. So house tell me, work, Ed. So. Yes, Bef- there you go. Essential works. That's what we did. We did a lot of that. Before you went to this auction, did you view a building in pest report to see what was wrong with the property before you bought it? Shut up, Lloyd. Look, we, all, we can't all have a business with, when we, we know we didn't do any of that. It just had a nice front and it was near my mother's. So here's another trick. I don't know if anyone's listening to this, but my wife lives in this area. It was from this area, right? And we were looking for our first house and we were looking all over the town. And I was like, what about here? What about there? And she kept saying, oh, what about here? What about there? And you know, it hit me. It just suddenly hit me. And I said, oh, hang on a second. I said, how far from your mother are you willing to live? And she said, five minutes. And I said, well, that's going to narrow down the search. And so that was the, <laughs> that was one <laughs> this of your was the key goals. Best. There you go. Exactly right. This was the house we could afford that was within five minutes of her mother's house. So that's the one we got. And in what year did you buy that, Ed? Do you remember? I don't know. That's a come on. Do are these tough questions? I don't know. Um, okay, well, let me guess. What was I doing? I was doing radio. I was doing, have you been paying attention? That's how I remember things from media gigs because they're normally about two years long. So that's how you go in the cycle. So, all right. I, I reckon that was 2017. And then you sold it last year. Yeah. I didn't want to sell it. I, I wanted to keep it till the end of time, but we'd structured it poorly. Thank you for asking. In the, in the mortgage and with the house that we're in now, we'd just done some renovations and all right. So we bought, here's, here's another tip I'll give you. The current house we're in now, we bought this house off a jockey. Never buy a house off a jockey. Lloyd, in your next book, we're having a, a chapter called Never Buy a House Off a Jockey because I bought a house off a jockey and that tricky little bugger, there are so many things wrong with this joint. And every time I ring him, I would ring him. I was like, agent. I said, the agent, give me his number. He's fine. I would ring him. And he'd go, okay, mate, how you going? I go, say it again. Okay, mate, what's wrong? I go, mate, there's, um, there's, a, there's a tap that, that just seems to make noise and not do anything to which he was outside. And he goes, yeah, no, nah, mate, that tap doesn't work. I was like, no worries, see ya. And there are just so many things <laughs> like that. Never buy a house off a jockey. You heard it here first. Okay, well, we can have another chapter about that. And there's probably a few other <laughs> chapters we can have about who not to yeah, buy a house. real estate agents, comedians. These are all the worst people. Never buy Australia. a house from a real estate agent. Now, that will make Yes. Us... Is that true? Is that, a, is that a truism? Well, no, but well, we can make it one. And that could be a thing Oh, no, I was saying if they actually live there. Because often agents oh. say, you know, actually. Well, do you know I used to live in the same um, as street as Bill Shorten, the federal opposition leader? Yep. And he was selling his house. And I'm like, why would anyone buy a house of a politician? You, can't, you know, he's a nice guy, but come on. As if anything they're saying is true about that house. That's right. Absolutely. But I guess the thing is, yeah, don't buy a, a house that's owned by a politician. Definitely. There you go. Yeah. Which or, is hard because they own most of them or through re- their or various deals. Agent. That's it. Yeah, <laughs> through their various deals that none of us know about. That's it. Um, love to take a step back and talk a little bit about how you got into to media. Obviously, you talked about a few of the original um, gigs you had at the time, but obviously, you, you, you know, when you um, started on Thank God You're Here and, and went from there, you've obviously built a really good career from there. So, so it'd be really cool for people to know about that. Yeah, so I was I, so getting back to property. I was living in share houses in in Sydney, and and as you guys know, I was in like a I was in a so so. What the reason I bring it back to that is because it shows you. How important I think, even property wise, I know that people are kids now are rampant to get their own, their first house to own it. You know, my my brother in law is twenty five and he just bought an apartment and he's rampant to get it. But I know what I don't know. I'd love to know what you know what you guys did when you were in your you know twenties and 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 early thirties or, or you know early twenties and stuff. But for me, the share house rental experience 
uh, in Sydney. It's where I formed so many professional relationships that I still have now. It's where you sort of learnt to how to deal with a household, you know, like bills and this and that, and I and and also the socialising, you know, effect that that had on me now. So, for instance, in my share house in Newtown, um, which is I drove past it the other day, it's still there. They haven't done a minute, I haven't done a second's work on it. It's just one of the great money spinners. And we used to call it um, the Thai restaurant because I don't know, you know, you guys know that in the inner west in Sydney, Thai restaurants they often have quite unusual you know like uh painting schemes like there'll be one wall will be red one wall will be sort of purple they just they love it they just sort of it gives it a bit of jazz so anyway we had our every wall in our house was painted a different color and we worked out what they were doing was just covering cracks with whichever whichever paint was cheapest that week so every single room was everything was a different color and there were six of us living in a share house but are uh, in that share house and it was 120 dollars a week and the idea was so in the front room was my mate who is now the general manager of Baz Luhrmann's film company. In the other room was my mate who is now Tommy Murphy, one of uh, Sydney and Australia's best writers. In the, in my room was obviously me and then my girlfriend who has ended up being in one of, you know, a very, very popular Australian uh, rock band. She left me for the drummer. I don't want to talk about it. And then, so what you, but to get back to that is that that's where I got started because I was in living with people and at uni doing theater sports, which is sort of, you know, short improvised scenes. I got to do a lot of stage time and hang out with people because my living costs weren't that high. And it was through that, that Glenn Robbins once saw me doing improv. I didn't even know he was there. And then I got a call uh, from working dog uh, saying that there's this idea. I didn't know what it was. And we went and we did a test shoot of Thank God You're Here, where we were just in Hessian sacks pretending to be Romans uh, at a small theatre. And that became Thank God You're Here. And then on that same week, uh, to, to pay my rent, I was the reader at audition. So, you know, people go to an audition and there's someone off camera reading the lines. And I was doing lines for a movie that Mick Malloy was making. And he heard me and my best mate, Josh Lawson, uh, who's an actor, a very well-known actor now, he got a role and we got a role together. So in the same week of that, I got a two a, t- a film, a television show, and because I met Tony Martin at a party for that film, he gave me the job as a radio co-host with him that week. So in one week, I went from the usher being the usher at Papa Tree of the Penis at the Footbridge Theatre and working part time driving the cars to having a television show, a radio show, uh, and a role in a film. So luck, my friends, is the only way that I got anywhere. I wouldn't say I wouldn't say luck. I think a lot of a lot of talent with that as well. But I think it's um it's really interesting what you say about the share housing because I was the same. Like I was in my late twenties before I actually bought my first property. Um, so there you go. As I outlined in my book, but in my early twenties, yeah. I was I was doing a lot of share housing, and I lived in a share house in Newtown with about five or six other people. Sort of what the, street? Uh, Chalder Street. Well, that's near, I was in Camden Street, so the, that's not that far away. Not yeah. far away, and uh, and just before yeah. that, I was just down the road in in Erskineville. So, uh, but yeah. we had five or six people living there, depending on who yeah. sort of you know moved in that yeah. night and who left yeah, the next yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. But it did form yeah. a lot of relationships uh, that that you tend to work with those people in, in coming years. So um, I think that's one of the rite of passage of, of kids these days. Do you remember what your rent was in at the at the at the at the new uh, town? Right? I was paying forty dollars a week. See, this is the thing. I'm glad you bring this up. So the young people who work with me on uh, Today FM who produce us, they're in share houses in St. Peter's, Erskineville, things like that. They're telling me that rooms, $350, $400. How can you expect anyone? It's crazy. You know, guys, how can anyone expect to get anywhere when a share house is that much money? It's crazy because I, I remember that specifically because the whole house was about $200 a week in That's Erskineville exactly and right. Newtown. Yes. Uh, yes. Like, people can't imagine that. And this was back in the mid Mid nineties, because I was at uni. So you're similar to me. So you're a little bit older than me. But so here's a classic example for you guys. So Chippendale, you know, uh, Cleveland Road. So uh, Cleveland Street. Sorry, Cleveland Street. There used to be this place. I think it's still there, but as of course, you know, it's going to be developed. That's fine. But it was near uni. It was this place called the Chocolate Factory, and it was one floor of a former chocolate factory. And my one of my university friends sort of got possession of it. You never had a lease. You got possession of it. And then it was a certain amount. It was like 600 a month or something, something crazy like that. And then it was up to you how many people live there. And here's how you moved in because my girlfriend did it and I helped her. You would go to the chocolate factory and it was our mate who was running it now, sort of the landlord of it. And you said, can I move in? And he'd go, yeah, no worries. And he would wave your hand. He did I'm so clear. He waved his hand to the corner where they had a series of temporary walls. And here's the deal. If you could build a bedroom, you could move in. 
Wow. <laughs> So you uh, you obviously speak to a lot of people in uh, in your roles in media and on radio and stuff. Uh, given that people are paying three or four hundred dollars a room now to rent, uh, there there's definitely is a rental crisis around the country. What what do you think would be an answer um, that the politicians have to come up with to to help solve that crisis? So I think you're really right. What you said about apartment blocks. What's happening with apartment blocks is there's that one. I had a real estate agent tell me. You know, he said he didn't want to be named, but in preparation for this, I was actually just chatting to you know people in and around, and they said there's this one phenomenon. I don't know if you guys know. I'm sure you know about it. Where overseas and, and other investors are buying apartments and leaving them empty. So there's a lot of empty apartments, and it sort of it started in New York. Is that those you know those luxury things and people trying to hide money? Is that where it started? It did is start that, there, that, um, and okay. it, it does happen in Sydney and particularly around Barangaroo. There's more upmarket sort of okay. properties. There you go. And so that is one, there's one issue there. You can't have land banking in apartments. You just, it's, that's insanity, for, I think anyway, because what's the, what's the overall economic benefit to the country of that? Well, there isn't one. It's just, it becomes a drain, right? So that's, that's one. You've got to find a way to, to, to crack down on that. And the other one, I don't know, I mean, I don't know how you'd ever do this, but I hear what you're saying about the release of land, but it's always land released for the exact same purpose where it's like, oh, there's a new suburb being built. And I remember when I was driving the cars for Today FM, I once went out to a new suburb near Campbelltown and how's this for a deal? I was on the radio doing an ad saying, if you're the first person to buy a house on a street in this suburb, you get to name the street. What a great promotion. That's right? great. So, yeah, I think I remember that ad actually. <laughs> it was actually really, it was actually amazing. Oh, do you remember that ad? I think I do, yeah. It was amazing. Yeah. It, was, it, it was very was, funny. It yeah. Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. They, they, they ended up with like Dickhead Crescent and like Rooster Lane, but it was good fun. But um, there was, but they, so I think when you release those, it's great that there's, there's more housing coming, but people don't want to go there until there's, as you say, you know, in your in your book, there's got to be stuff there. So infrastructure. You, you've got to have supermarkets. You've got to have buses. You've got to have schools. You can't just like people can't just live in like a house in the middle of nowhere. It's like glamping. It's, there's got to be stuff there. It's got to go the other way. It's got to go. Okay, we're going to do this. We're going to commit to this road. We're going to do that. Like the airport. You know, you and I have been chatting about the the Western Sydney Badgerys Creek Airport. Perfect example. When's that? That's been been getting promised since the 70s. It's now actually going to happen. Why not just release a hard completion date? It will be finished by this date. Here are the bus routes that are going to go there. Here are the things. That the, if the government said all that, then that makes the housing around that, yeah, okay, it goes up in value, but it means you're, you can move there knowing there's going to be something there. That's right. That's you, right. You and want the transport. You want the infrastructure. Yes, you, want, you want the yes. mall to go. To. You don't want to get on the freeway for 45 minutes. Um, to come back to a suburb perfect. you've possibly left. That's a perfect example. I remember there was one, I don't, I don't want to name it, but we were, I remember running an ad for it once. And you know what their big selling point was for the, the new suburb? It's got a lake. I was like, who gives a shit? Does it have a coals? You can't go fishing. What are we going to go fishing for dinner? And Sydney's very much like that. I know myself, I was traveling 45 minutes from Bankstown to Lewisham. Every morning, drop the kids to school. It's 13 kilometers and it takes 45 minutes for 13 yeah, and that's, kilometers. And that is exactly what I'm talking about. That, 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 that's, a, that's a run that so many people would do and... Yeah, you know, that's exactly what I'm talking about. And that's, that, that's what we need to get off. We need to stop that. We need to be able to say, I'm driving five minutes to or from my kids' school, yep. coals, you know, my yep. work environment. And that makes a good suburb. If you've got schools, 100%. work, yep. and some sort of social activity, that suburb's going yep. to be very popular. Yep. You know, you know the ponds? Yeah. Mm, yes. I think they've done a great job. The ponds has... S s it's, it's well designed. There's there's plenty of access, and there's there's got stuff. There's stuff there. There's shops. There's stuff there. You know what I mean? But we need more of the ponds. We need more of that, and we needed it five years ago. And this is yep. our problem. Like you talked about prices in Sydney for rentals, they are out of control at the moment. Mm. Western Sydney rentals for the average person is very very expensive, and it's probably up mm. two to two hundred fifty dollars a week from what they were paying less than two years ago. And some people, that's a lot of money. That's no. just not sustainable. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, you know, it's all the old, remember the, the old, that's all just moved to the Gold Coast? Yeah. I was on the Gold Coast the other day. I'm from, originally from Brisbane. And I was on the Gold Coast the other day. And man, that M1, it is, it's like LA. Mm -hmm. There are certain times where you may as well just walk. Like it's getting, you know, it, it sort of happened to the Gold Coast. Do you know what I mean? Which as you know, as you say, 
in the book, you know, beware the holiday rental place, but it's sort of residentially, it's sort of happening in a, a similar way. It is now. And, and that's transformed in recent years, particularly, uh, I think particularly since the Commonwealth Games were there in 2018, that's really become, you know, even busier. And yeah, the, the motorway there is just crazy. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's not, not so much a holiday destination now that people are sort of trying to move there. There's a lot of new estates going up there, but uh, it's still still crazy prices and everything. Not enough, um, uh, you know, not enough housing. And, um, and I think schools. Well, that's the thing. But one of the things that, you know, the government's always talking about house, housing targets, but you don't hear them talk enough about infrastructure targets or school targets or how many coals and Woolworths they're going to put there. Mm. And, and also just the incentive. Why not incentivize it? Say to Aldi or whoever, hey, if you help, you know, you put in, you build, you help build this. Then you, you, we can help the you know we can help with your lease or whatever you want to call it for X amount of years just to give that. Um, no, for many many years Frank Lowy was just ahead of the population curve. He would put a Westfield in before, and then people would go right. There's a Westfield, yes, and build around that. That drove you know that drove a lot of suburbs. That drove a lot of areas, and then he did it. He started doing it in America as well. I don't know. I partly feel as though that. I don't know. I don't see a lot of that happening. No, and I think the blocks are a bit small out west too. Now I think that's also an issue we got to look at. There's no opportunity to do anything else once you buy your home out west. It's on 400 square meters, and you're a meter away from the house next to you. We need to make them a little bigger, so there is possibility even for redevelopment down the track. Just like's happening in in a west of Sydney, you know, you've got blocks that are 500, 600 square meters where they get redeveloped and we get new people in. And we're going to Did lose they invent that. the quarter? Didn't Annandale invent the quarter acre? Is it Annandale or Strathmore? It's Maybe one. Stratfield. It would have been Stratfield. Stratfield, back Stratfield. Stratfield. There you go. That invented the quarter acre, I believe. Yeah. Which, as we know now, quarter acre, you never really get that. Yeah. But it, it speaks to your point of you've got to have even yeah some 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 room to grow. I don't yeah. know. Is do you ever do that thing where you know you look at American cities? Well, is Sydney would rank what is it third of cities in America population wise? Melbourne second and third. I think it's something like I think it goes L A. Would go L A. New York. Melbourne, I think, or Sydney, I think. I mean, it's either it's it, certainly top five. You're, it's always remarkable how small major American cities actually are. And when you go there, you know, I know they got a lot more sort of land or whatever, but it's almost like it's almost like Australia is a capital city short. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and traffic and stuff doesn't flow very well uh, either because they they never build for the future. Like you look at, I mean, you take Sydney for example. You look at the M5. Should it been built, you know, three lanes each way. They just built two lanes, okay. not, not thinking past the next turn uh, that they're going to be I know. To I know. And what's the irony? The irony is that the Harbour Bridge is they pushed and pushed and pushed for the seven lanes. And at the time, I, they, you know, they still talk about how people, oh, it's overkill. You're never going to need that. You're never going to, and pushed and pushed and pushed for the train. You know what I mean? So they got that. They knew that they needed, they knew they needed that, but everything else subsequently, they just didn't. It's amazing because that you know, that was back in 1932 when that was opened, and they had all that, and that still it still works now. Uh, but the the you know, the roads they're building these days are not are not working very well for the population growth. So it sounds like you're still on your property journey, Ed, as well. So have you got any plans for the future, or what are you what are you thinking to do? Well, you tell me, gentlemen. No, absolutely. So the the idea would be to no longer make. You know how everyone now has to sort of be an expert in everything? So there's ads for share trading where it's all suddenly like, yeah, maybe I do know what's going to happen in the share market. Maybe I do know what's going to happen to Apple in five years where I don't know anything. There are people who spend their whole life studying this stuff. So for me now, it's more just like, all right, looking ahead, you know, 10, 20, 30 years, doing the best I possibly can with what we've got. And I think that, you know, property's just as, you know, as you guys know, property's just, if you've got a good plan, you can, it can work for you, but not if you just add, like I have, ad hoc it and hope for the best. That, that is just not, it's not like those old days where people bought a farm, didn't realize it was going to be next to the airport and then sold it for, a, or, or if you're a politician and you know where the train line's going, so you buy a plot of land in a, in a company that you pretend you don't own. I don't have access to either of those things. I think you so, brought up a good point where you go, you got to have a plan. I think a lot of people need to th focus on that if they're looking at property. Okay, what is their plan? What's the reason they're buying this property? Like, 
you bought a property five minutes from your mother-in-law and that's part of your plan and there's nothing wrong with that. And so people should factor all these little things in because it may mean they don't move down the track when they have children. I know you've got two children yourself and probably your mother-in-law comes over, helps you look after them and that helps yeah, build that's, your that's plan. Bad fire. They've moved to Bali. That's bad oh, fire. There you go. Uh, but have a plan. I think it's really good. I think you've read Lloyd's books by the sounds of it as well and he's very clear on saying we, you need a plan. You need to have a plan but for don't property. You, you need that for everything now. Like, in ter- property is like something that I think in Australia has been sold as, ah, you'll be right, just get one. Yeah, I don't, Where, I, that's wrong. Yeah. You know what I mean? Let's like with a job, remember with a job, ah, just get a job, you'll be right. No, you've got to, I think it seems to be more fun too. It seems to be more fun to have a, uh, was it the sleep at night factor? That's the one where you go, the sleep. And the, I, I know we're not going to get into it much here, but I reckon the negative gearing, obsession is i don't know i don't know you guys know much better than me but it doesn't seem like it benefits it feels like the banks are the best other beneficiaries mainly of, of well, the banks and a, with negative gearing and accountants because they love to yeah, to, yeah. to find they things like that gearing. and tell you how much you're going to save on, on tax or something but that that's a big obsession you know dating back way way when you know 60s 70s and 80s you know our parents grandparents were kind of doing that and just told everybody to do that but doesn't really make much money uh, makes much sense to you know to lose money on a property on on the hope you're gonna uh, you know have a property worth a little bit more later on because you wouldn't run a business like that really well that's that really hit me when you when i heard you say that in because i'm an audio book guy and um i that hit, i was like yep yeah, there you go that is you just wouldn't run it you wouldn't run it i mean if you're going to run something at a loss forever i mean we call that channel 10 you know what i mean why would you do that <laughs> I love how everyone who yeah. appears on Channel 10 bags out Channel 10. <laughs> Something got on there. Yeah. <laughs> it's because we're all hoping to move to Channel 7, that bastion of morals that is Channel 7. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if I'm being honest, super honest. So I'd love to have an unencumbered home, you know, and property invested so that my children would benefit from that in whatever way that ends up taking place. That would be, if I asked the kid, you know, in the rental with a really super hardworking single mum who's, you know, doing her absolutely level best, who absolutely, and I excuse swearing, fucks up when we do get some money. If I speak to that person, that 20-year-old kid, I would say to him, i.e. me, I'd say, get a plan. Don't be afraid to start small. Don't be afraid to start away from what you think is cool and be and think long-term so that, you can laugh about the things you do wrong rather than let them keep you up at night. Well, that's that's right. And we're always going to do things wrong and everything. But I think having a plan and understanding where you want to be, and I think what you're saying about, you know, leaving a house, a legacy for your kids is really important because that's essentially why I do what I do. Uh, you know, we've got we've got that un- unencumbered house now, which would, uh, you know, be for the, for the kids and whatever and, and some other properties. But, uh, but if you don't have a plan and don't know why you're doing it, then uh, you know you don't really uh, you got no you got nowhere to go really because it's really about you know do you want to achieve that uh, sense of passive income do you want to retire do you want to leave a legacy for the kids you've got to have mm. a reason for doing it and that also can help you to understand what sort of property you need to buy to help you get there uh, and and that, again mm. we talk about positive versus negative gearing you need to have that conversation and understand what's best for you so there's a lot of things to consider uh, and well unless like you want to be like Husey and you just buy houses uh on a whim just because you want to seem cool on TV. I mean, ultimately, that's what I'd really like to be, just to try buy houses just to get some airtime. That's that's living. Well, I've that's always living. I've always wanted to be one of those buys agents on the block as well, but I've never been asked yet, so he's hoping. <laughs> yeah, be sure, be careful what you wish for, mate. You've got to deal with some genuine weirdos if that's, if, that's your, if that's your dream in life. I know, Scotty, I can put in a good word. But he won't. You're, you're too sensible. You'll say it's not worth that. They don't want to hear that when they're trying to get when they're trying to get five million for a, you know a three better with plastic furniture. And you say I don't know if it's worth that. That's not what they want to hear. But most of those buyers agents get outbid anyway because you know <laughs> yeah that's <laughs> by two maniacs. That's right. They had their old school maniac who bought them all. Yep. Then they got a new maniac who buys them all. So yep. they're going to have to find they're going to find have to find some new maniacs. That's it. Yep. I'll put my hand up to be a maniac. Why not? Well, I'll talk to Scotty. He's uh, he, well, we talked about you know Scott Cam. He's she's Louise. There's a guy who knows his property. My God, the the the, the stuff he owns. My goodness. Uh, and look, I think some of those points you touched on too. I know you've had a couple of little negative experience, but I think there's always a positive you can get out of them too. And I'm sure it made you do a little bit more research the second time you bought something, and now probably you're more educated to how to make that decision in property. Do you think? I think I'm more educated to know what I don't know. 
I think it's more yeah. to know to ask people who do know what they're doing. I think that is actually more where I'm at, where I reckon I could probably make the same mistakes again, left to my own devices, but it's more thinking, what are you doing? Everything in my work is is done by people who know it better than me. I don't try and do the sound on my shows. I don't try and, you know, build the sets, you know, all that stuff. There are always people who can know, who know more about something than you do. Mm -hmm. And you know, it always shits me. You know, when you, you need to listen to a podcast with a CEO and a t-shirt and they say, you know, I just try and be the dumbest person in the room. And I always just try and surround myself. You know that, you know, that yeah, line yeah, that yeah. you hear from everyone, every Ted talk starts with that. And I always think to myself, well, why am I listening to the dumbest person in the room? Why can't we interview all those other people who know more than you do? Get off. It's, so it's, I never, yeah. it's, it's that thing. Like if, you're, if, you're, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. You're in the wrong room. It's like, well, right, I don't want to listen but, to you. I want to listen to the other people that should be in that that's room. That's right. But that's right. It's, <laughs> but having said that, it's like, okay, that, that does apply when you're outside of the thing that you do know. And that's what I've learned. I think I would genuinely make those same mistakes again. But I, think, I would think, I think, I think that's with I any, know not to. Yeah. I think that's with anything because uh, like, you know, you know, you're not going to get a car. You're not going to fix your own car unless you're a mechanic sort no. of thing. And so I, I do think that having an expert on your side to help guide you with what you're trying to do and, and whatever your whatever path you're taking, whatever you're, tr you're trying to achieve is obviously very important. Mm. Yeah. I think your work ethic goes a lot to it too, Ed. I think um, looking back on how you've come up and been brought up, I think being a very strong person and diligent at your job, I think has also helped you. And you sound like you're not a person that gives up easily. So you've had a bad, bad experience, but you've got back on there and you you keep moving forward. I think that's, yeah, that's something to be commendable about. I think dwelling mm. is dwelling is the thing. Dwell, dwelling on this didn't go well, that didn't go. We go so Ridley Scott, the guy who directed Alien and, and Gladiator and that you know legendary UK director and writer and producer. I remember hearing an interview with him and he said that in order for him to keep working, he had close to, it was like over 100 projects in development. And you hear something like that and you go, well, if that's what Ridley Scott needs to do, I probably need to have about 10,000 running at the same time. So I'm not someone who's ever uh, taken, I hope anyway, taken the, you know, taken the jobs that I have uh, in this, this very fickle business for granted. Maybe I, probably, maybe I have at some point, but try not to. And so that you can keep, um, as you say, try and keep working so that you can, because you've got children now. My son's teeth, right, the other day. He goes to, if ever this, okay, here you go. You ask me again, what do I, why do I want to have a plan for property and passive income and retiring? Because my son, six years old, went to the dentist the other day. And they said to him, first thing he walks in, they go, oh, you got 100% overbite. What does that mean? So you're going to need pre-orthodontics, pre-orthodontics. He's six. And so I'm already thinking dollars. And then, he, then they look in his mouth and he's, his teeth that he's got, you know, he's, he's lost a couple of teeth. The new ones, he doesn't create enamel. His body doesn't create enamel. And so we've got to put mousse on his teeth. He's going to have veneers by the time he's 11, by this stage. He's going to look like Madonna. And so I'm like, nothing is going to motivate you more to stay employed and to keep working as when a dentist tells you that your son doesn't create enamel on his teeth. That is a motivating factor like you cannot believe. Yeah, Families can do that. What is that? I said, that's my wife's side. He said, you people don't create enamel. I can tell. You've had it too easy. My family, nothing but enamel, you know? Yeah. And has your wife helped you with your property journey as well? Has she had good experiences with property? And just, I'm just looking to see if she can hear me. She's the one who's like, we can afford that. You know, those people, we can afford that. She's a, we can afford that person. She's a very positive, we'll work it out. Let's just start a renovation, see what happens. That's her go. Let's play you as know, much as we can at auction, whatever the agent asks for. Yeah, yeah, couldn't care less. I like it. She's an I like it person. She's a, isn't the front of it pretty. She's that. That's how we ended up with a house from a jockey because she liked the flow of it. And you know what we, you know what, do you know what guys, do you know what she really likes about it? We can see her mother's house from our balcony. That's what she really likes about it. Um, and with other, the other things as well, obviously, have you read both of Lloyd's books and did you have any points there that you liked? Like I've read, I've actually uh, learned I've stuff from Lloyd too. I, I actually enjoyed his books. I actually enjoyed his books. Let me give you a little tip. The next time you interview someone and they've released something in the media space, don't use the word actually before you saying you enjoyed it because it makes it sound like you're not, that you, that you didn't think you were going to enjoy it. Thank you for the tip. I'll take that on board. Where, now let's try that again. Yeah. I've read Loy's books and I found them very informative. What did you like about them? That was okay, but it sounded like you were under duress. It did sound a little bit like a I think I was. Okay, let's turn this around. Ed, how, how would you say? I think I was. 
<laughs> uh, it sounded like a hostage yeah. video. So, uh, okay, the first things first, it's I like that uh, Lloyd used to teach at Mariah as a boy who went to Vaucluse High School before the state government sold it. I loved, I liked that about him and I and that I liked that he had a real job before he got into property and worked at his real job for a long time. Not that it is a real job, but you know what I'm getting at. And then I like that the idea that that negative gearing is a is not something that has to be just taken as medicine, that it doesn't need to be. And I liked that Lloyd understands, uh, clearly understands the difference between numbers and context, whereby it can look like it's a great deal. But if you don't understand that Newcastle, for instance, is this and has that expectation to it, and this is the type of place it is, and this is where it's going, this is where it is, then it may be a good deal or it may not, because that was the mistake I made. The mistake I made was to say, Melbourne's a big city, surely people want to live in the CBD as they had started doing Sydney at that time. That looks like a good price. I'll just sign it here. They're going to build the building, aren't they? Why would there possibly be any more costs? Which was all incorrect. But what I liked about Lloyd's work so far is that the, the, that I enjoyed was that the, he clearly has context attached uh, to the figures, which is key for me. That is the key thing for the whole thing. Yeah, I did like those stories. Lloyd puts in little um, stories about how the process went with somebody and it goes through the whole process and what they ended up with, which I think was telling it as a story actually got to me. Yeah. That, that and, got and to and me. The, I relate to that. Yeah, there you go. So the, the con- that, that, that makes it more like, as you know, Lloyd, like there's no, pro- as you say, like no properties are equal and certainly no places are equal. And it might be things that people don't see, like ability to split the title or, or the way they're fronted or what's happening in the surrounding areas. You know, that's nothing you're ever going to hear from a real estate agent or an accountant. They're just not going to know that. Uh, we've just about come to the end of our uh, episode today. So uh, is there anything else you wanted to add, Ed? Well, I'm selling some apartments off the plan. Uh, now, listen, they're in Launceston and they're $2 million each, but I can tell you that that town is going to boom very soon. So please hit me up on Instagram if you'd like one. Okay. Well, we'll keep that in mind. Um, Amanda, are you looking for an apartment in Launceston? <laughs> oh, <laughs> not right at the moment. Um, well, I appreciate it. Unless that, the price yeah. is right. Yeah. I'm going to yeah, talk to Lloyd mil. first. I'm going to talk right. to Lloyd first and see if he yeah. thinks Mate. it's a good idea. Yeah. Amanda, it's $2 million and up. That, mm-hmm. I'm accepting offers above, above $2, $2 million. Million. That's yeah, above two million. We're not even. This is lawn testing, guys. We're not talking anything what, under two mil. What do you think, Lloyd? Is that a good investment? Should we be looking at that? Um, well, it's. Not, I'd rather keep it within Australia. <laughs> so um, you know, that's, that's probably where I start. <laughs> none, of offshore, none of this offshore. <laughs> none of this stuff. None of this offshore <laughs> investing or buying overseas <laughs> or something. Actually, I got a one off the cuff, right? I thought, I, I you know, now that the, my media, ha- Amanda, here's a t- here's a here's a um, here's a game that you two could play on your on your podcast, which would then break out into socials, right? This is the bit. Of, this is what I know. What I know is media, podcasting, etc. Right? Good deal, bad deal is a short segment you guys could do at the end of each podcast where you don't tell Lloyd anything, you don't tell him in advance, but you just get three listings and you go to you lay it out for him, and he's got it off the top of his head just for fun. No, have no, not, not commit to it whether you think it would be a good deal or a bad deal. I'll go first. Lloyd, I did this for you because I knew I'd want to this. You ready, Lloyd? I'm ready. Okay. There's an apartment going in Chiang Mai in Thailand, right? Northern Thailand. My Cavali is a Thai last name. People don't know, but a lot of my family is Thai. So that's why Cavali is a Thai last name or whatever it is Armando called me. So Cavali is a Thai last name. There's an apartment going in Chiang Mai, Northern Thailand. Good university access. A lot of backpackers go there. It's in a four bedroom, uh, no, a four story uh, block, and they only want one hundred and twenty grand, two, three bedroom, one car space. Good deal, bad deal. I think that's a, a good deal. Uh, I actually know someone who's building apartments in um, in Thailand, uh, and um, they're, yes. they're very they're very much talking it up, and they're more expensive than that as well. So you could get some ec- maybe instant equity. That what if you get it for the right price, like one twenty? That's what they're asking. See, well, I wonder how fun was that? You didn't know he was going to say good deal. So, no, I like so your you. I wife like would pay 120 for it. That's what they're asking. So you should go in about 90 and go from there. Yeah, see, that's that's why I need you. Do you have a blonde wig? You should come. And next time we buy something, this is my wife, Tiff. This she. <laughs> <laughs> what do you reckon, Amanda? That's a bit of fun, I, isn't it? I thought that was great. I think we should pick that up in their podcasts. I'll bring in two deals. Don't know if I'm going to go all the way to Thailand for the deals, 
But maybe look around yeah, Australia. That's why, I, I, think, that's why yeah, so, then, well, I don't think that's Edward why was so way, fun. I don't think Edward was good. went all the way to Thailand for that deal either. He just like, you know, I think he, like, he knew a bit about it. So Armando is a real estate agent, so he will have plenty of deals that he could bring to the table. That's great. That's perfect. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm going to email him and get a Google Translate. I accept. Let's see how that goes. It's a bit <laughs> of fun. But yeah, no, look, thanks, thanks very much for coming on. It's been an absolute hoot today. I uh, really enjoyed uh, learning a bit about your, um, your insight, uh, your journey in property, uh, learning a bit about your, uh, yeah, your upbringing, what you've done with, um, with media, which we all knew about anyway, but it's really good to, to understand how you got into that. Uh, and um, yeah, we've really enjoyed the laugh. And um, Armando, it's been really great to share another episode with you as well. That was really good. Thank you very much, Ed, for coming on. I really appreciate it. Hi. I know very much kind for having me. If anyone's listening to this that hasn't got uh, Lloyd's book, Positively Geared, I strongly recommend it. Um, but, you know, full disclosure, we have been chatting off air, but that's about a musical we're hoping to put on. And, uh, no, thank you both for having me. It's been, uh, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Ed.